listeners. My name is Raina McIntyre. I'm from the Kirby Institute. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather today and pay my respect to their elders, past, present and emerging. Uh, I'm currently in um, the Gadigal, Gadigal, Nation, Gadigal land of the Eero Nation um, and the Kirby Institute is on Bidjigal land. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. Some housekeeping to start off with. The format of the seminar will be a presentation followed by Q&A at the end. If you'd like to ask a question, please click on the icon in the speech bubble and the question mark in the top right hand corner to open the Q&A chat panel and put, put your question in there. Um, and when you click ask a question, please remember to write your name. That'll help us reference your question and make the answering easier. And um, hopefully uh, the, the speaker will have time to answer several questions. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome and introduce Professor Nikolai Petrovsky, who's Chairman and Research Director of Vaccine PTY Limited, an Adelaide-based biotechnology company focused on vaccine development together with being Professor of Medicine at Flinders University and Director of Endocrinology at Flinders Medical Centre. Over the last 16 years, he's been Principal Investigator on five NIH grants totaling over $50 million, with a focus on development of vaccine adjuvants and a pandemic vaccine platform. He's authored over 200 research papers and won many prestigious awards, including the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award, his current focus is developing of the COVAX-19 vaccine against COVID-19. So please welcome Professor Nikolai Petrovsky. So thank you very much, Raina, for that kind introduction and to the Kirby for giving me the opportunity to present uh, some of our insights today into both uh, vaccines against COVID-19, but also um, some of our work into the origins of the uh, virus. So in terms of some of the key points that I want to discuss today um, uh, is, you know, ultimately how did this pandemic start and, and where did the virus come from? Um, how are we going to protect ourselves against it, both the current pandemic and, and future pandemics and, and the role of vaccines uh, in, in that? Um, you know, some of the discussion that's been going on in the community, particularly about um, both the safety and efficacy of the different vaccine platforms, and in particular, what should we be doing about the variant vaccines? And then if I have time, talk about some of the gaps that still exist in research into COVID-19, because we don't know certainly everything, and, and some would argue we, we know still very little about um, this virus. Uh, and most importantly, what are the lessons that we should be taking away from this pandemic uh, for future pandemics? Because this certainly isn't uh, the last one we're going to experience. So just to give by way of background, the role of my team um, in this is that we, we essentially were awarded funding from the National Institutes of Health in the, in the US after the 9-11 anthrax attacks. And uh, at the same time, of course, the world experienced a, a SARS coronavirus outbreak. So we proposed at that time back in 2004 to uh, focus on development and use of our adjuvant technology um, in development of better vaccines against anthrax and, and also in development of, of a vaccine against the SARS coronavirus. So. Since then, we've been very fortunate to get a lot more support uh, from the NIH, uh, which has taken us into a whole range of different exotic viruses and potential pandemic viruses and developing vaccines against these, including a whole range of different avian influenza viruses, particularly H5 and H7, uh, more recently the, the MERS coronavirus. And then we've done quite a bit of work with the US military on vaccines against uh, uh, exotic viruses such as Ebola and, and Hantan. So we've really been in this space now for, for 20 years and over that time uh, have been building a vaccine platform uh, 
uh, that we're hoping is is robust and able to be utilised uh, almost for any new pandemic uh, outbreak. And the basis of the platform, and this is important both to understand uh, vaccine technology, but also how we got into researching the origins of the virus, is that we, we've designed a system where unlike traditional viral vaccines, where you have to find and isolate the virus causing the disease, you then have to grow it in, in culture or in animals, purify it, inactivate it and make your vaccine, which obviously is problematic when you're dealing with a highly lethal virus and, and, and you need to manufacture this at scale um, because you need a BSL-3 manufacturing facility of which very few exist uh, around the world. So with our platform, we designed it so as to be virus independent. And what I mean by this is essentially with our vaccine design, we go straight from the genomic sequence of the virus um, to, to the vaccine without ever actually handling the, the actual uh, virus itself. And so the, the way this works is that when a new virus is discovered, uh, as happened with COVID-19 in, in January uh, of last year when, when it was first reported, the genomic sequence these days is typically available within a few days of the first uh, virus isolation. Unfortunately, um, there was a hold up in the release of that information, but in early January, the genomic sequence of the new virus was released. Um, and obviously at that time, nothing was really known about the virus. But in fact, with our methods, uh, we we're able to take that genomic sequence, break it apart, work out which is the attachment receptor, model the attachment receptor, identify the potential receptor it's attaching to, and start our vaccine development uh, using that sequence, which we then get uh, synthesized uh, synthetically into an artificial gene. Uh, in our case, we, we use a baclovirus, which is a, 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 a insect cell uh, virus uh, to, to actually transfect uh, our, our insect cells, which to make the recombinant protein. Uh, so this is done in, in culture uh, and, and we design it so it's a secreted protein. So then, then all we have to do is purify it using chromatography we get a, a pure recombinant protein, which we then formulate with our adjuvant. And this is an example of in 2009, how we went from the genomic sequence of the swine flu virus to human clinical trials in under three, three months. Um, so it's a very, very fast uh, way of developing vaccines. And we're able to show, and this is the results of the human trial we did in 2009 against swine flu, that providing we formulate the recombinant protein uh, with our adjuvant, which we call ADVAX, we're able to achieve extremely high levels of zero protection in the immunized subjects. So obviously we're hoping to replicate this uh, for COVID-19, uh, just as we did uh, for, for swine flu. <clears throat> as I mentioned, um, over the years we've worked on a lot of exotic uh, and, and less exotic uh, viruses, bacteria, uh, toxins such as ricin, uh, and we've also developed vaccines in the space of cancer, allergy, Alzheimer's and most recently drug addiction. So, so really the, this, this approach is very robust and can be applied to, to many uh, different problems, but obviously today I'm just going to focus uh, on what we're doing in, in COVID-19. The other benefit of our platform is that, um, as I mentioned, it, it, it's, it's very safe and effective. We've demonstrated this now in, in a large number of human clinical trials across various different pathogens, uh, particularly you know, seasonal influenza strains, uh, pandemic influenza strains like H5 and, and H7, uh, hepatitis B, a number of allergy vaccines, uh, a universal peptide-based uh, flu vaccine, uh, uh, and obviously most recently uh, COVID-19 vaccine. So I, I guess going back to the beginning of the pandemic, the first question people had was, you know, is, is a coronavirus vaccine actually going to work? Um, and there were a number of people actually arguing that, that it wasn't going to be possible. And, 
you know, I think probably the most eminent of those was Professor Ian Fraser, who cast a lot of doubts on, on the feasibility of developing a vaccine against COVID-19. But I hope by now people accept that certainly this is uh, an achievable objective, and obviously that's the reason we, we're now uh, immunising the world's population. Um, and the reason we were confident that we could develop a vaccine against COVID-19 is we've done it many times before. Um, you know, we've published data on our successful SARS coronavirus vaccine, uh, which dates back to, to 2004. We've also published uh, successful challenges uh, in camels and alpacas uh, using a, a, a similar approach to develop a MERS coronavirus vaccine. So it's not surprising given the close relationship of COVID-19 and particularly SARS that using the same approach uh, that we're able to achieve the same outcome and we have a number of manuscripts currently uh, in, in publication on, on the results of this, and I'll show you just a few slides uh, to exemplify what I think are some of the key findings from uh, animal studies. Obviously, the, the world is, has become more complicated uh, in this pandemic because we have a number of new technologies that have been rolled out uh, for the first time, uh, particularly the uh, adenoviral vector vaccines uh, exemplified by AstraZeneca, um, uh, Johnson and Johnson and and, and Sputnik, uh, the mRNA vaccines of Pfizer and Moderna, um, uh, and, and then you have the more traditional approaches, which is is largely the the inactivated vaccines from China and and uh, one from from India, um, one DNA sort of loaner vaccine uh, from from Inovio, and, and then the area we are focused on, which is the subunit recombinant proteins. Uh, where we, we're in a group with Novavax, Sanofi and, and Clover all attempting to make uh, a, a synthetic protein based vaccine against COVID-19. And again, I'm not going to dwell on all the differences uh, between these technologies today, but just to tell you a little bit about what we're doing. So when we were designing this, as I said, we're back in January um, 2020, all we had was a genomic sequence. Uh, no proteins had yet been described um, for the virus because, because there just wasn't any information available. So we wanted to design a vaccine, so we really had to do it directly from the genomic sequence, and fortunately our technology allows to do that. We were able to, to use the homology to the SARS uh, genomic sequence, which had been characterised, uh, to identify the different proteins uh, within the COVID-19 genomic sequence and from that identify the spike protein and start to characterise the spike protein um, and design a vaccine based around the spike protein given this is how we developed a, a successful vaccine against uh, SARS and, and also MERS. Uh, what we, we know about the, the spike protein is that it forms a trimer and this is true of of SARS, MERS and, and now has been confirmed for COVID-19. So obviously it's very important when you're making a recombinant protein to get the, the structure absolutely right, which uh, is not always uh, easy. Uh, but just to demonstrate under negative stain EM, this is our antigen construct. You'll see these nice cone-like structures corresponding to the spike trimer. Uh, which form into a higher order uh, rosette-like structure. Uh, we then just formulate this recombinant protein with our polysaccharide adjuvant, uh, and this is the, the final vaccine uh, formulation. And of course, we've done many uh, animal challenge studies now in a whole range of species to confirm the effectiveness of the vaccine, and we've also confirmed its safety in, in human clinical trials. But what Rainer has asked me to do is also um, to get into this perhaps more controversial issue, um, which is um, the, you know, where are the origins of the COVID-19 virus? And, and I think it has relevance both to our vaccine work, but also to the broader question of how do we prevent future pandemics occurring? So the first question I thought was might be useful to explain is how back in January last year did we get into this um, very, um, I guess, uh, uh, vigorous debate 
um, uh, of where did the virus come from. And I, I, you know, I, I think to explain it, you need to understand what we were trying to do at the time. So we were trying in January last year to decipher the genomic sequence of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which where we had no data on the virus, but all we had was the genomic sequence. And, and we were trying to decipher it in order to design, ideally, a, a vaccine candidate. Um, and and to, to understand the, the virus, um, oops, we, we essentially blasted it against originally the SARS um, coronavirus sequence, uh, which allowed us to identify the spike protein. I mean, we noticed, I mean, there's only about 80% homology. So there were some obviously clear differences in the, the across the genome. Uh, but one of the, the early things we noticed is that the um, SARS-CoV-2 uh, sequence in, in the spike protein had a furin cleavage site, uh, which wasn't present in, in, in the original SARS coronavirus. Now, that has relevance both to our vaccine design, as we found out subsequently, if you leave the uh, furin cleavage site in the protein, uh, then it becomes unstable. And in fact, that um, was a, an issue with our very first uh, vaccine formulation. Um, so, so it was highly relevant, the fact that it had this furin cleavage site. And in fact, we were able to remove the furin cleavage site and revert it to the SARS sequence. And suddenly the, the vaccine uh, antigen uh, performed uh, much, much better. Um, so it did look to us like the furin cleavage site was not um, necessarily a native part of the spike protein. And that, that, that intrigued us at the time, although we didn't think too much more uh, about it. We then set about, um, because we had just the sequence of the spike protein, but there were no uh, obviously crystal structures at the time because no one had any protein. Uh, so we decided to use uh, in silico methods to build uh, a 3D uh, structure of the spike protein, because this is one of our key expertises uh, is, is in, in silico modeling uh, of protein structures. Uh, and so we decided we would do, build a model um, of the spike protein, um, really to try and determine its key features, its, you know, how it might be different to the SARS spike protein for which, you know, we do have crystal structures. And also at that time uh, to try and identify what might be the human receptor, because you have to remember in, in January last year, uh, there was no knowledge of, of what uh, receptor in the human body this virus might be binding. Um, so we used uh, molecular dynamic simulation and, and uh, 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 to optimize a 3D structure of the spike protein. Uh, we then actually looked and adopted to a number of different candidate receptors, uh, including because of SARS, um, obviously the human uh, ACE2 uh, uh, receptor. Uh, but also we looked at, at DPP4, which is the receptor for MERS and a num number of other candidate receptors, and were able to confirm very high affinity binding uh, to human ACE2. So about the same time as the Chinese published that this was the receptor uh, from their in vitro studies, we had already confirmed uh, using our modeling that this was likely uh, to be the receptor, which meant that the vaccine idea of of blocking spike protein attachment to ACE2 uh, was a valid candidate uh, for, for a vaccine program. So this was reassuring. Um, at the time, again, back in January and February, there was a lot of speculation about which animal was it that had infected humans? You know, what was the vector? And we know in SARS that this was a civet cat. Um, and, uh, and obviously people at the time were speculating about snakes and um, other animals. I think civet cats came into it um, and, uh, and then pangolins. And, uh, and so we decided to take um, an approach to identify this animal because at the time, again, we like everyone else believed that this must be a natural uh, zoonotic transmission. Um, and so we thought, well, if we take our in silico approach, uh, because most of the genomic sequences for ACE2 from a, many, many different species are now available, but they're no 3D protein structures, we thought we could use a modeling approach to model all these different species of ACE2 
clock them with uh, the viral spike protein. And then obviously, if we found a very high affinity interaction for a particular species, then this would make it a candidate as the original uh, host of the virus. <clears throat> so, um, so this is just going back to some of our very early data. Um, as I say, we deciphered the spike protein from COVID-19 uh, from the genomic sequence by actually using the spike protein of SARS as a template. Uh, what you can see is there's about 80, uh, 75 to 80 percent homology uh, across the spike protein when you compare SARS and COVID-19. But essentially, this was able to allow us to identify the full length um, spike protein even before it had been uh, characterized uh, in a protein sense. Um, we then were able to build uh, models of, of the spike protein and obviously uh, quite soon thereafter, crystal structures uh, started to become available. Uh, showing that the, the spike protein formed into a trimeric structure. Uh, it was heavily glycosylated, shown uh, in, in um, pink here, are all of the uh, glycosylation sites on the protein. It has different domains which are relevant, uh, the key one being the receptor binding domain uh, that binds to, to ACE2 uh, in this region. Uh, but also the N-terminal domain, which uh, remains a little bit more mysterious, uh, is clearly critical to the virus uh, infectivity uh, because a number of antibodies to the N-terminal domain actually prevent infection by the virus, uh, but its function is less well known. Uh, and then it has the, the stalk, uh, which normally has the, the transmembrane domain that attaches it uh, to, to the viral membrane. Um, and, uh, and so we were able to model this structure, obviously, to design a, a vaccine. But at the same time, we we're able to simulate um, the binding of, of these structures uh, to human ACE2 and, and to other ACE2s. Um, and, and so this is just a depiction of how uh, the spike trimer actually binds uh, ACE2, uh, which is normally a dimer. Um, and so essentially one of the three uh, um, receptor binding domains uh, of the spike protein uh, opens and uh, in this open form, it, it then uh, attaches to uh, the human uh, ACE2 receptor um, through a number of, of molecular interactions. And so you, we, we were decided as part of our uh, plan to get to the animal that caused this, this outbreak uh, to model the different ACE2 structures from all the different animal species, dock them onto uh, the spike protein, and then measure the affinity of this interaction as, as, as an indicator of whether or not uh, the virus was actually native um, to that species um, of, of animals. Um, Obviously, you know, and, and I, I guess to explain, you know, when we build these models of spike protein with ACE2 uh, and run these simulations, we can actually answer many different questions um, and we still haven't fully exhausted these possibilities. Obviously, we can study how antibodies interfere with the interaction between spike and, and ACE2. So how do the, we can study how the vaccines are working uh, in silico. We can also examine what happens if the spike protein mutates. And so uh, we can simulate the different variants that exist or even variants that don't yet exist uh, to explore how that might affect their interaction with, with human ACE2 and with the ACE2 of other species to look at whether some mutations may make the virus less uh, human specific. We can use it to design broadly neutralizing antibodies uh, because we can simulate binding of antibodies uh, similarly to the spike protein uh, and see how this interferes with ACE2 association. Uh, we can use it to design better spike proteins uh, or different spike proteins that may be able to induce more broadly neutralizing antibodies. Uh, we can obviously study the relationship between the spike proteins on different coronaviruses. So how does uh, as COVID-19 spike protein differ to say SARS uh, uh, coronavirus spike protein or, or for instance pangolin uh, coronavirus spike protein uh, to understand the species um, specificities. 
And lastly, you know, and this is what we said about, we can explore the species specificity of COVID-19 uh, by studying the strength of this interaction uh, through our computer simulations. Um, so, so essentially, you know, what we, we're looking at is, is multimodal because we can change the spike protein in the simulation. And so we've got spike protein, for instance, shown here of, of, of COVID. Uh, you know, we can simulate the pangolin coronavirus spike protein or the spike proteins of viruses uh, that are said to be very close to SARS-CoV-2, such as the RAT G13 uh, virus from uh, isolated from bats uh, by the Chinese scientists. Um, and, and we can then simulate how these all behave differently when binding to human ACE2 or to ACE2 uh, from, from other species. Um, so when we're looking at, at ACE2 and simulating different um, species of ACE2, um, this is just looking at, at the phylogenetic tree uh, of, of ACE2 across different species uh, based, based on uh, sequence uh, homology. Um, and, and you'll see that, um, you know, here are, is, is human ACE2 here. Um, and so obviously, if you believe this virus is very specific for human ACE2, uh, then you would naturally expect, based on sequence, that it, you know, the virus would also infect gorillas, as we know it does, and, and monkeys, which we know it does. Uh, obviously, mice and rats actually aren't that distant, um, which may be surprising because obviously we know the virus doesn't infect uh, mice. Um, and, and then you can see um, the ACE2 of, say, pangolins is a long, long way away from human ACE2. Um, and, and obviously, if you, if you, so if you look at this distance based on sequence, you would say it's not possible for uh, a virus um, that binds human ACE2 to be likely to bind to, to pangolin ACE2. But this is based on sequence. And what I'm going to show you is what happens when you look at these relationships actually based on actual structure of the ACE2 rather than the the sequence of the ACE2. <clears throat> so what we're able to do when we, we simulate so all of these different models um, is that we're able to look um, at the residues in the different species of ACE2 receptor binding domain um, that interact with the spike protein from, from the virus. Um, so when you dock the, the viral spike protein onto different species of ACE2, you can obviously identify what are the interacting uh, residues. And then you can look at the conservation of those residues uh, in the different species of ACE2 to try and predict, uh, you know, which species is this virus likely to infect or not. Um, so you can see that if you do this, um, certainly monkey ACE2, uh, all of the uh, interacting residues that bind the spike protein are completely conserved with the human ACE2. So you might predict that, that obviously monkey would be very uh, permissive uh, to infection of a coronavirus that infects uh, humans via human uh, ACE2. Uh, but you can see that other animals um, such as, as uh, ferrets and dogs and mice uh, have a very low conservation of these uh, interacting residues uh, that are predicted to interact with spike protein. So you might from that data, if you're basing this on sequence, not expect uh, pangolins or snakes or dogs or ferrets to actually be uh, infectable by this virus because the key residues in ACE2 are not conserved uh, in these species. And yet we know that these species, or at least some of them, are actually permissive, such as the ferret, are actually permissive to uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, infectivity. So sequence-based analysis has major limitations. So what we then did is move to a structural-based analysis, which meant that we had to make the structures for all of these uh, ACE2 molecules, because apart from from human, essentially none of these ACE2s had ever been crystallized. Um, so we had to build their structures in silico. We have various ways of determining the quality of our structures uh, using these scoring systems. And essentially everything over 95 is an extremely 
uh, uh, accurate uh, or, or high confidence model, and you can see that's true uh, of all the GACE 2s we model. So this is the result of that initial modeling is that you get a structure um, that's optimized. So this is um, the structure of, um, uh, uh, for instance, of, of BAT ACE 2. Uh, and then we look at its quality and we then did this for all of the different species to build the different structures. Um, and then we docked those uh, with uh, the, the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 and then measured the binding affinity of, of those interactions and, and then just ranked them. And so essentially what we came out with is, is this list. Uh, you can see that human uh, um, uh, ACE2 has the highest uh, potential binding affinity uh, to to the COVID spike protein of all species that we tested. Obviously, there's many other species out there, but um, humans were at the top. Uh, you can see that mice were at the very bottom. Um, and in fact, you know, if you think experimentally, I mean, humans are the most affected by this virus, and we know that mice are not infected by this virus. So, so at least at the extremes, it suggests that this modeling approach is able to rank uh, permissiveness of this virus. I mean, there's some interesting things as you go down the list. I mean, certainly all of the permissive species are in the top half of the binding affinities. So this is much more accurate than predictions based on sequence, which weren't able to separate the permissive species from the non-permissive species, whereas our modeling approach was, um, again, suggesting that it is an accurate way to study this interaction. The really interesting things are that species such as bat, uh, we predicted not to be permissive, and in fact have subsequently shown not to be infected by COVID-19, indicating that this virus did not cross over from a, directly from a bat to a human because it simply can't infect bats. Um, so it's impossible to postulate that as, as an origin of the virus. Um, the other interesting thing is that pangolins, which you know came into the story early, um, actually just sit just below humans. They're significantly lower binding affinity, but they are the second highest of the list, and I'll come back to that uh, later because I think it is relevant. And the other interesting thing is monkeys, although they shared 100% of the interacting same interacting residues between spike and ACE2, actually had a much lower affinity. Uh, than, than humans or pangolins, uh, even though these two shared less sequence uh, homology, they actually had more structural homology. So again, indicating a structural based homology approach is much more powerful than sequence. So, so what do we think about the pangolin? Because the pangolin keeps coming back into this story, and I know the Chinese government just reran the pangolin story last week because uh, I think they're under a lot of pressure. And so they thought they'd just pull this one out of the bag again and say it it, it could have been the pangolin uh, that started um, this outbreak. Um, certainly, as I say, our modeling showed uh, that the pangolin uh, um, ACE2 binds almost equally well um, to, to the uh, spike protein as does human ACE2. So, you know, on this basis, you could say maybe Maybe they're right. Maybe um, this virus uh, was evolved uh, to bind pangolin ACE2 and crossed over to humans. But uh, as I'll explain, there's there's a number of, of major issues if you go down that um, path. Um, so so uh, you know the the first thing is to to try and is is to understand um, the the relationship or the events that led to the pangolin. Uh, getting implicated in the whole story, uh, which which actually was was a complete misunderstanding. Um, so it turns out that pangolins are infected by their own coronavirus, um, which is called the pangolin uh, coronavirus or pangolin COV. And and that was identified, um, you know, in in pre um, COVID-19. Uh, a number of pangolins in China had been found to be infected and were found to to have a a coronavirus, which was um, sequenced and and studied, including in the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Um, and 
And then after COVID-19, there was a, a, a confusion uh, between a number of groups of scientists in China who all claimed and published saying they'd found COVID-19 in an animal, uh, being the pangolin. Um, but it turned out that that was not correct. Um, what they had discovered is that SARS-CoV-2 spike protein in the receptor binding domain specifically um, has, has almost 100% sequence homology to the pangolin um, uh, a spike protein receptor binding domain. So it really looked like the pangolin, a piece of the pangolin spike protein that's critical to attachment to the human receptor had been lifted out of the pangolin coronavirus and put into SARS-CoV-2. Um, so the rest of the, the, the genomic sequence of the pangolin coronavirus had very low homology to, to COVID-19. So obviously COVID-19 is not, um, doesn't have its origins in a pangolin coronavirus. It's very, very distant. But what it does share is a piece of the pangolin uh, coronavirus spike protein that's almost identical, almost looking like it's been lifted out of a pangolin uh, and stuck into some other virus backbone, uh, which has then created uh, SARS-CoV-2. So, so, so as I say, there, there is links to the pangolin, but they're very strange um, links. The other important data, which just came out a couple of days ago, um, you know, given that the Chinese are rerunning the whole pangolin story, is that it turns out that um, there was a survey uh, being done across all the wild animal markets in Wuhan um, in, in between May 2017, and November 2019. So these are the very key dates um, because of, of, in fact, an irrelevant study um, that was looking at um, tick-borne uh, viruses that were causing problems in China. And so these academics were going to every animal market in, in Wuhan uh, and looking at all of the animals that were being traded uh, in those markets uh, and, and recording them. And it turns out that they, they have confirmed uh, through all of their records uh, that there is definitively no evidence of any pangolins or in fact bats being traded in any of the markets in Wuhan during any of the relevant time. So there's no way to suggest uh, that, you know, there was a trade going on uh, in pangolins or bats through the Wuhan wet markets that could have triggered this outbreak because the animals were being looked for by these people uh, and were not found. Um, and in fact, I mean, interestingly, um, what, what they note is that Clearly, the Chinese government were, were not regulating um, the trade in all of these protected species because these vendors were happy to demonstrate these illegal animals um, to, to the team, um, uh, even although it was highly illegal under Chinese law and, and should result in a 15 year jail sentence. Um, so clearly, the Chinese government were turning a blind eye to this trade. Uh, but nevertheless, there was no trade in pangolins or bats actually going on in Wuhan uh, at the time. So, so the key unanswered questions then about all of this is if the, the COVID-19, you know, um, didn't come from a pangolin, uh, which would have had to have been co-infected with both a pangolin coronavirus and an unknown bat coronavirus to create COVID-19, um, and that then bat or pangolin would have had to have stumbled into Wuhan, not through the markets, but, you know, just wandering. Um, and, and of course, the odds that a single infected pangolin would meet a single human and infect them, you know, is it at odds of billions to one. Um, and if that didn't happen, because it's so improbable, then the key question is, how did the pangolin spike receptor binding domain end up in the COVID-19 backbone because there's no other explanation for how it got there. Um, the other question is, you know, if you believe that pangolins could have been the source of the outbreak, um, then we know that COVID-19, the spike protein, is avid for pangolin uh, ACE2. We've, we've demonstrated that. Um, so why wouldn't this virus have then gone 
you know, through all of the pangolin population, just like it's currently going through the human population. And if so, why can't we find any uh, evidence of any infected pangolin populations, either in captivity or in the wild, uh, that are infected with the precursor uh, virus? Or even, you know, even if they're not currently infected, why aren't they seropositive? And no one has come up with any evidence pangolins are seropositive uh, for COVID-19. Um, again, if there was an outbreak going on in pangolins, if you really believe that is possible, um, then obviously there should be evidence of multiple spillover events. I mean, just with MERS, with camels, you know, there's, there's now several hundred spillover events um, from camels to, to humans with MERS. Uh, whereas there's no evidence of any uh, uh, anything other than a single spillover event of of COVID-19 into humans. Uh, whereas if this was in in pangolins, it should be spilling over into humans uh, on a regular basis. Uh, and in fact, pangolin coronaviruses, which we know are in pangolins, should also be crossing over to humans given the homology between their RBDs. Uh, and their ability to bind both pangolin and human ACE2, but we don't see that. Even if you believe, again, this virus is from pangolins, then it doesn't explain the furin cleavage site because the pangolin coronavirus doesn't contain a furin cleavage site, so it still doesn't explain how that got there. And, and I guess, you know, if you, if you say all of this just seems so highly improbable as to be almost impossible, um, then what's the other alternative explanation? And I think the first thing you have to do if you're trying to explore that is to ask, was all the information and tools available, you know, in China and in Wuhan in late 2009, if someone had wanted to, and again, we're not saying someone did this, but if they wanted to, would they have had the information and tools to take the pangolin coronavirus receptor binding domain. This was known uh, in China, it had been sequenced uh, repeatedly, including in early 2019. So the information was there in their hands. Um, if they would put this into a, a bat coronavirus backbone because they were trying to understand how bats might cross over to humans, then conceptually, you know, they might have put a, a, a pangolin uh, sequence into the bat to improve its chance of infecting human cells. And then, of course, if that was only partially successful, then, of course, they may have thought, well, maybe, you know, it will work better if we add a furin cleavage site. We know these work well in MERS and, and other coronaviruses, not any direct relative, but distant relatives. Um, and these furin cleavage sites had been put into other viruses, so they might plausibly have put a furin cleavage site in to increase its infectivity. So if we just say, was the information and tools there at the time, the answer is clearly yes. So the capability was there, the information was there, all it would require is someone to do those particular studies. And of course, we can't say whether or not that happened uh, because we don't have that uh, information. So that's where we got into the origins debate uh, very innocently. You know, we, we the more we look at it, the, the, the harder we find to postulate, um, you know, that, that this is easily explained by a natural origin. And of course, the lack of evidence of, of any natural origin for which we have zero evidence, um, of course, makes it uh, potentially more likely that there was a different origin. Uh, and obviously a laboratory experiment gone wrong is a plausible other explanation. So just to finish, I thought um, I'd like to just get back to vaccines for a cup, just a couple of minutes and then uh, I'll take questions. Uh, but because this whole this all started when we were developing a vaccine, I better thought I better tell you whether we'd actually managed to make a vaccine. Um, so so this is just some ferret data uh, where we've given ferrets two doses intramuscularly of our vaccine and then they've been challenged. This was done at the University of Georgia. Uh, needless to say, we we're able to show uh, this is the ferret lungs. This is staining for the virus itself in the lungs, which is positive in control animals, obviously completely negative in the immunized animals, indicating they're protected against uh, lung virus replication. But notably, they were also protected against day three 
uh, viral replication because none of the immunized animals in these two groups had any uh, recoverable virus from the nose uh, even at day three, which was very exciting because at the time AstraZeneca in their monkey studies had shown no effect of the vaccine on nasal virus replication, even though they had shown a reduction in lung virus. So, so this was unique when comparing our vaccine uh, to the AstraZeneca vaccine. We then recently got data which was uh, done by a colleague, uh, Kaiser Tabanov in Kazakhstan, uh, in the hamster model, uh, where he was testing our vaccine uh, a against a receptor binding domain vaccine that, that he was developing, uh, which he'd formulated in some different adjuvants. And then, of course, he had a control group. And suffice to say, what he found when he looked at viral replication is the same as we saw in the ferrets. So the control animals, very high levels of uh, recoverable virus at day three. His RBD vaccine constructs, and I believe this is going to be true of all the RBD vaccines, they're not going to, they may give very mild protection, but they're not very effective. You can see they haven't stopped viral replication, uh, whereas you can see all animals uh, in, in our uh, pro protein group uh, had absolutely no virus, just as we saw in the ferrets. Also, our vaccine was the only group where the animals put on weight uh, throughout the challenge, so they weren't sick at all. Uh, and notably, he actually did what I think was quite unique. So day two of the challenge, he actually put naive animals into the same cage to see whether the vaccine might uh, block transmission. Uh, suffice to say, uh, the control animals transmitted disease to naive animals. Uh, his receptor binding domain immunized animals transmitted disease to, to naive animals. Uh, there was no transmission of disease uh, from the animals that have received our vaccine to naive animals, which we believe is actually the first sort of definitive proof of uh, transmission blocking in an animal model. Uh, and, and then we've obviously done studies in elderly monkeys uh, and we find the, exactly the same findings, essentially sterilizing immunity in the lungs at, at day seven uh, in the animals that have been vaccinated versus high lung viral loads uh, in the animals that haven't been vaccinated. Uh, obviously, the focus now is on variants, uh, uh, particularly, you know, the, the, and I guess they've been renamed here, but particularly the, the beta, gamma and delta variants, uh, to, uh, we, given the evidence that vaccines uh, are not as effective uh, against these variants. So I think in South Africa, it looks like the Pfizer vaccine dropped to about 70%, Novavax 60, J&J 50 and AstraZeneca actually was provided no significant uh, protection. So it looks like there is a gradation of efficacy uh, when you're, you're being exposed to variants. And so it's important we have a variant vaccine. So we're now designing our vaccine to protect against uh, all of these variants. And then just uh, for a few last slides, just for information really to finish off, I uh, just looking at the statistics today. Um, so this is the case fatality rate of COVID-19. Uh, what you see is most countries, the fatality rate has coalesced around uh, 2%. So 2% of people who contract COVID-19 uh, will die from it. And I think that now is pretty well the accepted uh, figure. Uh, in terms of how many people have been vaccinated, Israel obviously uh, has the highest population coverage currently. Uh, Australia is, is, is arguably uh, tracking the worst in the world uh, in terms of, of our uptake, although it has ticked up a little bit uh, in recent uh, days. Um, obviously, we're at a very low level of the population in terms of full vaccination coverage. Most people in Australia have still only had one vaccine, so we're only looking at about 2% who've had a full vaccination course uh, versus about 70% um, in, in Israel. Um, Obviously, the number of vaccine doses administered, it's, it's harder to immunize the whole population of China than the whole population of Australia. But so if you look at the number of vaccines actually administered in Australia, it's tiny, whereas, you know, China now has blown past 750 million doses administered. Um, so they're obviously doing a lot better in terms of total number of doses. And of course, we're left with all of these questions still, which I can't answer, but 
um, I think are going to be really important going forward, including, you know, what about vaccinating children? How long are vaccines going to work for? What do we need for the booster? Uh, and ultimately, this unanswered question, you know, uh, you know, where is the virus going? And where did the virus come from? They're still completely unanswered uh, questions today. And they're important because future pandemics are, are really inevitable. Um, we have to accept that there are going to be more pandemics. And the next one may not be that far away. I mean, they come sporadically. You know, we could be faced with another pandemic even before COVID-19 uh, has been sorted out. So just to acknowledge all the tremendous support we've had from a whole range of, of institutions around the world, uh, but particularly uh, for, for Stu at the Kirby Institute, who's been helping us uh, with a lot of our neutralization uh, virus assays. Um, so I'll finish there and happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Nikolai. That was a fantastic talk and really great to hear about your work. Um, there's no questions in the chat. Can I ask people to put their questions in the chat? Um, I've got a question about adverse events. Um, in looking at the kind of rare but serious adverse events with some of the vaccines, including thrombotic thrombocytopenia syndrome with the um, adenovirus vectored vaccines and the um, potential myocarditis and pericarditis with the mRNA vaccines, um, do you think that a protein-based vaccine is less likely to have, given that it's an old technology, we've got a lot of protein-based vaccines that have been used um, in the world in the past, uh, your thoughts on adverse events and how this, this and other protein-based vaccines might pan out? Absolutely, it's a very important question. And, and I think the distinguishing feature um, of the uh, recombinant protein based vaccines and the inactivated vaccines <coughs> versus the other technologies is that they stay extracellular. So, so when we inject our protein or if we you know, inject an inactivated uh, viral vaccine like our flu vaccines and obviously the Chinese um, COVID vaccines, those proteins don't go inside the cells per se, they stay on the outside. Um, some of them are taken up by dendritic cells and processed and presented, which is how we get the immune response, but they don't go into any other cells. The difference is with mRNA and adenovirus vectors is you're transfect they gene therapies. So you're transfecting many different cells across the body um, with those genes that are now going to start expressing protein inside cells and not just inside cells in the muscle, um, that's, that's not true. You know, these systems potentially express spike protein in, in many different parts of the body inside the cells. Now that has two consequences. One is that the spike protein expressed inside the cell might start interfering with normal cellular signaling and, and because, you know, it's a foreign protein in a cell it shouldn't be in. Um, and that may trigger a side effect. The other thing is that you go, because the protein is inside cells, you're going to get a lot of presentation of that protein by those cells on MHC class one. What that means is that those cells will look like a viral infected cells. And so our cytotoxic T cells are gonna come in and kill those cells thinking that this is a virally infected cell. I mean, that's what our immune system is designed to do. Now that's fine if, if, if you know, the, the spike protein is on a few muscle cells and a few muscle cells get killed uh, by those cytotoxic T cells. But what happens if, if that mRNA or, or, or that adenovirus vector goes to the brain or, you know, to the ovary or, or to a sensitive tissue or to the beta cell in the pancreas, for instance, because if that cell starts to make that protein and puts it on class one, and now our T cells come in and kill that tissue, that, that could have very negative consequences. And so there are these very fundamental differences between a protein and as I say, inactivated virus is a protein. So they, they sit in, I think the safest category. The answer with the gene therapy type approaches 
is is we really don't know what their long term consequences are going to be. So we can speculate about it, but the problem is here here today we you know we simply don't know. So I think the reliability of protein uh, and inactivated viruses and the safety aspect of that you know uh, uh, you know is at least as important as the efficacy um, and 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 we can get in debates about you know relative efficacy i think the inactivated vaccines it's been a bit disappointing it's been at the low side i think for the recombinant proteins based on novavax's data and certainly on our animal data we're seeing very high levels of protection so you know if we have strong safety and strong protection you know, that would be my preference over an mRNA or an adenovirus, you know, if I was choosing for myself. But obviously, everyone needs to make that choice themselves. And it depends what is made available to them. Thanks for that. Uh, and I think that question might become quite a live one when it gets to vaccination of children in Australia, uh, what vaccine we choose, because it's... Um something that probably is going to be necessary in the in the future. Um, a question here from Jonathan King. How effective are the Sinopharms appearing to be? I assume the Sinopharm vaccine. How reliable are the reporting data? Look, um, we've, we've got more data on, on Sinopharm. Obviously, there was just a publication of their, their trial last week um, from, from the United Arab Emirates, where, where they did a lot of the, the clinical trials. Um, you know, o overall, I think that the, the data suggested, like all of the vaccines, it, it protects best against um, serious disease and, and death. Um, but the the efficacy against actual um, you know symptomatic sort of low grade infection was was quite um, low, um, and and so you know there's no evidence that for instance it's been able to block transmission. So so it's not to say it it, it doesn't have benefits because any vaccine that prevents death and and you know ICU admission is is a plus. Uh, but but it does suggest that the efficacy may be short lived. And I know in UAE they're now offering a third dose of vaccine to the people who received the Sinopharm vaccine. And my interpretation of 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 giving everyone a third dose of the same thing is they're not convinced that um, that vaccine in, in its two dose format is sufficiently robust to compete with the other vaccines. Um, so I think, yeah, we, we are getting more data on some of those Chinese vaccines, but, you know, it hasn't been terribly transparent to date. So I think people are right to be a little bit cautious and sceptical about claims of efficacy when, when the full data sets are not uh, being disclosed uh, publicly. Um, another question, is your vaccine in trials now? Yes, yeah, so so our vaccine is um, in phase two uh, clinical trials in the in the Middle East um, a, as we speak, and uh, we're hopeful that it will go into phase three uh, sometime in in the next uh, one to two quarters. So certainly um, this year. Okay, and there's a couple of questions about the origin, asking what you think the origin of the virus is, or put that controversial one to you. Look, yeah, journalists always try that on me, hoping to get um, anything other than all I can say is at the at the present time, it's an open question. There is no evidence that has been provided to prove that it comes from an animal source. There's a lot of unanswered questions of unusual features of the virus um, that are hard to explain by a natural cause, but at this point in time, we really can't say where the virus comes from. We can have suspicions, but but ultimately we have we need more data. Data will answer that question. Thanks. Uh, we're just about out of time. One more question here from Joanna Santos. Could you give a quick overview of nasal spray vaccines in development? <laughs> That's not a quick answer, is it? That's not a quick answer. I mean, obviously, there is, you know, um, the only approved nasal vaccine is flu mist, which is an, in, a, an attenuated influenza vaccine. Um, 
in the United States. Um, so, th so there's not a regulatory pathway, an easy regulatory pathway for a COVID uh, vaccine administered through the internasal route. You know, it's going to be a long path um, uh, because they're, you know, it's easier if, if, if you give all your other vaccines intramuscularly, it's very easy to, um, to, to approve a new intramuscular vaccine. I think an intranasal vaccine will, certainly there's some in development and we're involved uh, in, in a couple of programs um, uh, which are preclinical, so they're not yet in humans, uh, to develop uh, potential nasal uh, and other delivery routes. But in, in reality, I would see those as being second generation. I mean, even if they look promising, I, I would imagine it would be at least two to three years minimum before you would have have the ability to, um, you know, commercialise or, or even get close to doing a phase three clinical trial. So, so I think injected vaccines are, are what we're going to be relying on uh, for the next couple of years. Nikolai has kindly agreed to go a few minutes over for questions. So. Um, one more, what are your thoughts on mixed vaccination regimens um, for people in Australia who've had AstraZeneca? Will it be safe and effective to have Pfizer or another vaccine later? Look, I'm, I'm, I, I mean, the evidence is that mixing and matching vaccines um, works even better um, than, than having the same vaccine. The only reason we, we give the same vaccine is for simplicity and, and because of regulatory sort of requirements. But if you look at the science of immunology, um, you know, having heterologous prime boost, we've known for the last 30 or 40 years that always gives the best immunity, um, it, mixing and matching. Um, so so I, I, I think that, yeah, mixing and matching is, is the way to go. Um, as I say, the barrier is not the science and it's, it's not that it, it won't be even more effective than than either of the sort of uh, homologous approaches. It, it's a regulatory issue of reg, you know how how happy regulators are to see people mixing and matching vaccines where phase three trials have not been done on that mix match regimen. I think people are going to do it anyway, and I think you know doctors and people administering vaccines are eventually just going to start doing it. Even, even in the absence of a regulatory sort of guideline or ruling. Um, but so I'm, I, think it, it, I think it's a really good strategy. I think it, it's complicated by regulatory sort of rules and also by the fact that companies have a vested interest, you know, whether it's Pfizer or CSL, um, to say, well, if you've started with our vaccine, you have to finish with our vaccine because of course that gives them bigger sales. Um, so, so I think the barriers to mix match are not scientific barriers or efficacy barriers uh, or even safety barriers, because I think the evidence is it's probably safer to have one of each than it is to have two of the same potentially. Um, so, so it will be interesting going forward, but I think we'll see a lot of that uh, in the next year to two years. And we'll probably have to see it because if you have to boost an adenoviral vector vaccine, you can't give an adenoviral vector because you have an anti-vector immunity. So if you want to protect someone who's had AstraZeneca against one of these new variants, you're going to have to mix and match by definition. It's impossible not to. So I think it's going to happen. It will be interesting to see how it plays out and how the regulators sort of, how they handle it. Uh, thanks. Another question here. What are some of the other proteins that may be used in the vaccine other than the spike? and a related question from me about universal or pan coronavirus vaccines. So, um, so what are the other proteins? So this sort of goes back to the flu story, where you know flu with a recombinant, um, you know, protein approach. It's just based on hemagglutinin, uh, but we know that neuraminidase in flu also can contribute to protection. Hemagglutinin is the most important protein. Neuraminidase may add to that. Initially, people, when they were making those vaccines uh, like FluBlock, which is approved in the US, were contemplating actually having both proteins in the vaccine until they realized that that doubles the complexity of the vaccine, it doubles the cost of the vaccine, 
to put two proteins in where one does 90% of the work. Um, so they abandoned it. Um, and so I think that's the same answer I would have here with COVID-19. Yes, almost certainly some of the other proteins may have uh, a, a small additive effect, but the logistics, the cost, the complexity, the, the time to prove that and to redo all the clinical trials, I don't see that happening. Um, and so I think now what we're more focused on is do we need to add more versions of the spike protein to our formulation? And certainly this is the path we've gone, um, you know, to cover the variants. So we might have to, like flu, have three or four different spike proteins in our vaccine. That's already making it 400 times more complex than, you know, the original one protein. If we were to contemplate putting nuclear protein or something else in, it, it just becomes impossibly complicated and expensive. So, so I'm sorry, but I don't see any other uh, protein being incorporated into uh, a vaccine, or I think it's highly unlikely uh, that that will, will happen. In terms of un universal coverage, we've been working on a universal influenza vaccine strategy for 20 years, uh, which tells you it's not easy. Um, and uh, so I, I guess at this point in time, I, I would say I think a universal single, say, protein vac vaccine or a single vector vaccine is not going to happen because we tried that in flu and it failed. And, you know, we're still trying to find ways around that. I think what we will have is multivalent vaccines uh, that provide, you know, maybe not universal uh, protection, but that give you broad based protection against both the wild type strain and also the mutant strain. And we know our vaccine already is doing that. Um, we're seeing good neutralization uh, against, you know, strains like the, the South African strain and the UK strain uh, by adopting a multivalent formulation. So I think that's the direction we'll go in, but I'd, I'd hesitate to call that a universal vaccine. It's really just making sure we've got all the variants covered uh, in our vaccine formulation. Um, okay, there's one other more of a comment. I won't ask you to answer it from John Whiting. We never hear about your work from the federal government. Can you explain why and what can be done to encourage support for local R&D? <laughs> on that note, uh, my, uh, thank you very much, Nikolai. That was a fantastic talk and um, really, really interesting to hear about your work and uh, the way you stumbled on the, um, the the data that led you to start thinking about the origins of SARS-CoV-2. Um, so thanks again, and um, we'll close the meeting now. Thank you, and uh, it's been a pleasure.